All right, when you find 2 Samuel 16, would you stand? If you're able to stand, if you need to remain seated for health reasons, please do so. But follow along as we begin reading in verse 1. And when David was a little past the top of the hill, behold, Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, met him with a couple of asses saddled, and upon them two hundred loaves of bread, and an hundred bunches of raisins, and an hundred of summer fruits, and a bottle of wine. And the king said unto Ziba, What meanest thou by these? And Ziba said, The asses be for the king's household to ride on, and the bread and summer fruit for the young men to eat, and the wine that such as be faint in the wilderness may drink. Amen. And the king said, And where is thy master's son? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he abideth at Jerusalem. For he said, Today shall the house of Israel restore me the kingdom of my father. Then said the king to Ziba, Behold, thine are all that pertained unto Mephibosheth. And Ziba said, I humbly beseech thee that I may find grace in thy sight, my lord, O king. We'll stop there and we'll pray. Our Father, we thank you for tonight. It's just a joy to be here tonight. It's been a blessing. Thank you for the folks that have come this evening. Thank you for the gift of music. Yes, and Lord, we thank you for who you are, the fact that you love us, the fact that you sent your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross of Calvary for our sins. And Father, we come here this evening as a needy people. Amen. Lord, as a people that live in this human flesh that has an old nature, help us, Lord, to yield to thee and have victory over it. Please, Lord, help me to preach the message that I believe you've led me to preach tonight. Fill me with thy spirit. May, may your word have free course this evening. Amen. Pierce our hearts tonight, Lord. Encourage us tonight. Challenge us tonight. Do whatever it is we need this evening through the preaching of your word. And so I pray that all of us would be attentive to the preaching of your word. Please, may we all have ears to hear this evening. But we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So at the beginning of 2 Samuel chapter 15, that uh, Absalom, David's third born son, the pretty boy, the undisciplined rebel, began to work his plan to steal the throne from his father, David. What an evil plan that was. Right. How wicked could you be? After murdering his brother Amnon back in 2 Samuel 13, taking matters into his own hands and fleeing to Syria and spending the next three years there in his grandpa uh, grandparents' house, and then returning to Jerusalem, when he gets back to Jerusalem, what does he do? He begins to work his plan. He begins to work over the people. And he does this in chapter 15, oh, probably the first 12 verses of chapter 15, by doing things like this, pretending to care for them when he didn't. Criticizing his father's administration. Gathering a following at Hebron. And he worked this plan and worked this plan and organized and, and schemed. And Absalom's conspiracy worked. It absolutely did. For we read in 2 Samuel chapter 15 at the end of verse 12, notice and the conspiracy was strong. For the people increased continually with Absalom. Absalom's uprising was great enough for his father, the king, King David, to think that uh, the wisest thing to do, the safest thing to do, in order to keep the peace and avoid a civil war and save uh, the lives of innocent people, was for David himself to leave the city. Must have been a hard decision. What should I do? Do I go after my son? 
Do I start a, a civil war here? This battle here in God's city, the city of Jerusalem? And he thought, you know what? I just need to go. And he did. And in chapter 15, that's exactly what he did. From verses 13 on, David begins to leave. As he starts to leave, as we saw, I believe it was last week, we saw a great host of people that, that loved David, that were, were loyal to David, that respected David, that followed David. They began to say, we're going to go with you. Amen. We're following the king. And they're listed throughout uh, uh, the chapter. We read uh, in chapter 15 and verse 16, there were people from his family. In verse 15, uh, some of his household servants went with him as well. We read, interestingly enough, in verse 18, uh, that the Cherotites and the Pelotites and the Gittites, these were people from Gath, uh, they, they followed him as well. Uh, then we read in verse 18 of chapter 15 that the 600 men that had followed him in the past, when he was on the run from uh, King Saul, they said, we're in as well. We're following you. Amen. And then a man by the name of Ittai in verse 19. David begins to make his way out of the city. Oh, I can see it now. He marches and walks, uh, I would imagine, ever so slowly out of the city, probably looking to the ground or perhaps casting his eyes into heaven. And he walks down uh, out of those gates. He goes down that valley, the valley of Kidron. Uh, and he's there at the bottom and he crosses over that brook Kidron. And, and we see him making his way up Mount Olivet, weeping all the way. It must have been a pitiful sight. To see this king, this grown man, this ruler in Israel crying. And when he gets to the top of the mountain, we read there at the top of Mount Olivet, we read in verses 31 and 32 that he begins to pray and worship God. Amen. Imagine there he is a crying and weeping there and praying and giving God thanks for whatever's happening, not understanding why. Praise the Lord. Amen. But he made his decision. <laughs> when he's there uh, at the top of that mountain, uh, he's met by another man. I did not mention him last week. Uh, a man by the name of Hushai the archite. He was one of his loyal counselors. And David came up with his idea. He thought, well, why don't you go back? Uh, Hushai wanted to follow him. And David sends him back, uh, uh, kind of to act as a spy on behalf of David. Maybe you go back there and let me know what's going on. It's a sad time. While David is moving out, Absalom's moving in. Look at verse 37 of chapter 15. So Hushai, David's friend, came into the city, and Absalom came into Jerusalem. Now here in chapter 16, as it begins, we read that when David was a little past uh, the top of the hill. So we read uh, David is now starting to, he's beginning his journey back again. Hushai has left, uh, and he just gets over the tip of that hill, the top of Mount Olivet, uh, heading down the other side. And, and here comes somebody else. May I say another challenge for David? By the way, there's a lot of challenges in leadership. No matter where that leadership is, whether it be at work or, or in the home or in the church, there's all kinds of challenges. And David's going to meet another one here in this man by the name of Ziba. Here's this encounter. Four verses. That's it for now. David encounters this man and Ziba is going to see something very interesting and I'll prove it here in a little bit. He sees this moment in David's life as an opportunity. Amen. An opportunity... To deceive the king right. for his own benefit. And I don't want to preach on this subject, the deceiving of a king. The deceiving of a king. You ever been deceived by somebody? It's not fun. And nobody likes to be deceived. You know, I'd like to think in a perfect world... <laughs> In a perfect world, this isn't a perfect world. 
I like to think if everybody did the right thing, including myself, by the way, that we could just trust everybody. But the truth of the matter is you can't. Not even some Christians. Just being flat out honest tonight. 1 John 4, 1 says this, Beloved, believe not every spirit. Be careful. Amen. Don't swallow everything that comes down the pike. Don't glom on to everything somebody says. Don't believe every spirit. We're, we're told to, to try the spirits. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 4, Take heed that no man deceive you. You say, somebody would deceive me? Yes. You mean somebody that's a Christian would deceive? Yes. Right. Well, not everybody. I'm not saying we should walk around never trusting anyone. I'm not saying that at all. But I am saying this. We can be deceived. And there are some out there that intend to deceive. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 says this. Prove all things. Test everything you hear. Test it all. Don't just swallow everything. Don't just believe everything you hear. 2 John in verse 7 says, Many deceivers are entered into the world. The truth is, the, uh, is this. Uh, uh, there are some people who will use every opportunity for self-advancement. And Zeba was one of them. He is. Let's see how you say, Preacher, wait a minute. What are you reading? I didn't see that here. Well, let's put some, connect some dots here and put some scriptures together and find out something about this man Zeba and what he's done here and see what we can learn about Zeba deceiving the king. Notice, first of all, number one, the description of Zeba. Who is this man? Zeba. There's a name for you. Those of you wanting to name one of your kids, Zeba. I don't think I ever met a Zeba. I don't think I ever will. But you never know. Maybe after this message. No, you won't after this message. But who is this Zeba? Do you know that this is not the first time that we've met Zeba in Scripture? As a matter of fact, we see him uh, before this time. Uh, turn back with me to 2 Samuel chapter 9. Let's see if we can't connect the dots to find out who this man is. He is first introduced. This is the first time you see his name in Scripture here in 2 Samuel chapter 9. What is going on here? Do you remember when David first came to the throne? Or at least in his early days of the throne that he wanted to show kindness to any members that remained of the house of Saul for Jonathan's sake. Look at verse 1 of chapter 9. And David said, Is there any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul, that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. He's talking about Mephibosheth here. And the king said in verse 4 unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Then king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. Amen. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant uh, that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits, and thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread all the way at my table. 
Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Uh, then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's son. Amen. We'll stop there for time's sake. So here he is. He finds out that Mephibosheth is related to uh, uh, Saul. He's part of the household here. And, uh, of course, David calls this man Ziba to ask him about him, and he brings him to David. Of course, Mephibosheth, I think you know the story. There was a fleeing of Saul and his household during a war uh, with the Philistines. And when they fled, little Mephibosheth was five years old. And uh, Mephibosheth, or Jonathan's nurse, or the, the one who took care of the children, grabbed Mephibosheth, began to run out of the city, and somehow there was a fall or a stumble, and Mephibosheth fell down, and he got hurt extremely bad. So much so that he was lame for his entire life. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, uh, when David wants to show here later, much later, years later, kindness, he finds out that this Mephibosheth is still alive. And so he says, Ziba, who was of the household, of, was the servant there, he tells Ziba uh, to, uh, uh, to take care of the land for Mephibosheth, because David, in order to show the kindness, gives him all the land of Saul, but Mephibosheth can't take care of it. So he has Ziba do that for Mephibosheth. So Ziba is instructed by David uh, to him and his sons and his servants, 20 servants and 15 sons, uh, to till the land for Mephibosheth and to bring in the fruits of the land to make sure that Mephibosheth was well taken care of. That is this person, Ziba. And he did this thing for years. For years he was doing it for Mephibosheth. It was Mephibosheth's land. David had given it to him. And now here comes this Ziba to David with a story. But this is number one, the description of Ziba. But let's move on here. I laid that as a foundation going back to 2 Samuel chapter 16. And let's look at the deception of Ziba. So it all sounds good for now. But here we find a Ziba coming to David. Look at verse 1. We read, And when David was a little past the top of the hill, behold, Ziba, the servant of Meshibosheth, met, met him with a couple of asses saddle, and upon them two hundred loaves of bread, and an hundred bunches of raisins, and a hundred of summer fruits, and a bottle of wine. And so here comes this Ziba. Now on the surface, as you read it, uh, it seems like he's coming really to be a blessing to David. As a matter of fact, in verse 2, And the king said unto Ziba, What meanest thou by thee? Ziba, what is all this stuff you're bringing? Man, he seems like a nice guy. Well, look in verse 2 again. And Ziba said, The asses be for the king's household to ride on, and the bread and summer fruit for the young men to eat, and the wine that such as be faint in the wilderness may drink. Well, that's interesting. It seems like Ziba wants to be a blessing to David. It seems like Ziba wants to be a help to David. It seems like Ziba wants to tr try and provide for David and his men in the time of need. But I submit to you tonight, and I'll prove it here in a moment, that it was all a pretense. It was being a fake. Kind of like Absalom. Ziba is going to deceive David. Let me go on and read verse 3. And the king said, And where is thy master's son? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he abideth at Jerusalem, for he said, Today shall the house of Israel restore me the kingdom of my father. Wow. That's interesting. What's going on here? Ziba is going to use David's situation to take advantage of David to get something that Ziba wanted. I want to show you this deception of Ziba takes the four, three different forms. Notice, first of all, number one, his gifts. His gifts. I mean, look at all the things uh, that Ziba brought to David. I mean, two donkeys packed to the hilt. I mean, all kinds of things. Think about it. 200 loaves of bread. 100 bunches of raisins, 100 pieces of summer fruit, 
a bottle of wine. By the way, that's non-alcoholic, and all God's people said, amen. amen. That's another sermon. Uh, and uh, if you ask me, could we say, that's a little over the top. That's a lot of stuff. But understand, this was part of Ziba's plan. Let me go ahead and make an application here. There is nothing wrong with giving someone a gift. Amen? Amen? There's nothing wrong with being nice to people. There's nothing, in fact, we should. Right. Uh, there's nothing wrong the, with complimenting someone. You know, oh, you did a good job today, or this was a wonderful, there's nothing wrong with that. But let me say this, uh, beware of someone who's over the top. Amen. Beware of someone who constantly, show, constantly showers you with gifts or money or even compliments for that matter. I remember one time some people, they, they, they've said in the past, that was the greatest sermon I ever heard. And I think, you must not have heard a lot of sermons, my friend. <laughs> but then, you know, the very next one, they say, you know, that's the greatest sermon I ever heard. You know, that's the greatest sermon I ever heard. You know, that's the greatest. I mean, after a while, it's like, come on now. I'm not that dumb. I mean, uh, you know, uh, but think about, uh, beware uh, of someone that is constantly, constantly showering you with compliments and gifts and things and money. Again, because quite often it is an indication that that person has ulterior motives. Uh, they're doing something to either gain favor or make a say. You ever go into a, uh, I don't know if I should go here. Maybe I don't know. I don't like new car lots. I can't remember the last time I've been in a new car lot. And if you're a uh, car salesman, God bless you. I love you. We're glad you're here tonight. And I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about other people. But I'll tell you what. Uh, you can talk about really any over-the-top fake salesman. We've all had them, right? How wonderful you are and how... You, I mean, over, they just over the top. They just keep complimenting and complimenting and saying things. And you just want to go, please... Uh, I know what you're doing. You're trying to get a sale. I get it. Would you at least be honest and a little bit uh, genuine, if you would? You see, uh, uh, because often there's more to it. There's more behind the scenes uh, than just being nice. And such was the case with Zeba. This was a pretense. And beware of somebody like that. Let me show you what I mean. Go over to Proverbs chapter 23. You say, preacher, wow, you just you don't trust anybody. You just look out for this person. Let's see what the Bible says. How about that? Amen. Proverbs 23, look at verse 1. When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before thee, and put a knife to thy throat, if thou be a man given to appetite. That's interesting, isn't it? Be not desirous of his dainties, watch this, for they are deceitful meat. Come on in, have a seat. Oh, sit at the, the head of the table. Oh, what would you like this morning, uh, this evening? We'd love to give it steak, lobster tail. Oh, no problem. Uh, are you comfortable there? Would you like a nicer seat? Oh, come on, let's serve him. Come on. Watch out. Be careful when it's over the top, because that's what the Lord says here. He says, when you sit to eat with a ruler, consider what's before thee and put a knife to your throat. If that's cool, you're going to let that food and that scene influence you. It's better that you died. That's what he's saying there. Be not desirous of his dainties. Why? For they are deceitful meat. Look at verse 6. Eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye. Neither desire thou his dainty meat. Why? For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee. But his heart is not with thee. Again, notice Zeba's gifts. They're over the top. Do you know when scammers want to take advantage, and we've heard these stories a zillion times, of elderly, widow, wealthy widow women, how do they always begin? They shower them with compliments and gifts. That's how they do it. They're, they're trying to scam them. 
Do you know when child abusers lure in children, do you know how they start? With gifts and toys, candy, come. Yes, that's what they do. It is an attempt to win the confidence of the victim and cover their ulterior motives. You know, when the Lord in the Old Testament was appointing judges, he warned them of this because he knows how we can so easily be deceived by... You know why? Because it appeals to our pride. We like to think, well, I guess I am somebody. I guess I am that good. I guess I'm, I'm, I'm more handsome than I thought. Please, look in the mirror, amen? I'm just, I'm talking about myself now. Well, maybe Brother Cordry too. Yeah, definitely. No, I'm kidding. But in the Old Testament, the Lord was appointing judges. Listen to what he said, Deuteronomy 16, 19. Thou shalt not rest judgment, thou shalt not respect persons, neither take a gift. For a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. That's what he's saying. He's saying, if you're going to be a judge, you better be careful. Do not take a gift, because there's going to be people that want to win you over to their side. And the way that they do that is they shower you with gifts. Ziba. That's what he was doing. Psalm 26 and verse 9 and 10. Gather not my soul with sinners, uh, nor my life with bloody men, in whose hands is mischief, and their right hand is full of bribes. Be careful. Beware of someone who constantly showers you uh, with gifts and money and compliments. Uh, I mean over the top, because something's not right. It's awful quiet in here. Something's not right. Zeba wanted to come across as being nice, but there was more to it. There was more to it. So we see, first of all, uh, again, uh, in his deceit, his gifts. Notice, going back to the text, notice his gossip. Watch what he does. Watch what he does here. If I can get there, I'll show you. Uh, 2 Samuel 16, there it is. Look, look, look at verse 3. And the king said, And where is thy master's son? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he abideth at Jerusalem. For he said, Today shall the house of Israel restore me the kingdom of my father. Watch, he's working in a... The, boy, David's another Absalom kind of, kind of uh, character here. So after David hears uh, Ziba's spiel about his gifts, uh, I like, oh, the asses be for the king's household to ride on, and the bread and summer fruit for the young men to eat, and the wine uh, that be, such as be faint in the wilderness may drink. Uh, uh, David sees all that, then he starts to think of something. Wait a minute, Ziba, 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 Miss Mephibosheth's uh, servant, Ziba. Why are you here alone? He says, notice, uh, where is thy master's son? Where's Mephibosheth? Who's with him? That's what David's asking. See, but you, you're supposed to be watching over him. and You're supposed to be with him. You're, you and your sons are, are supposed to be uh, tilling the land. Where, where, where is he? Ziba tells him a bold face lie. Notice he says, Behold, he abideth at Jerusalem. Wow, who's in Jerusalem right now? Absalom is. For he said today, he said, Mephibosheth said, Today shall the house of Israel restore me the kingdom to my father. He tells David, Mephibosheth, where is he? Well, I'll tell you where that, that rascal is. In case you're wondering. <laughs> He's in Jerusalem. Not only is he in Jerusalem, but listen what he said. He said, today shall the house of Israel restore me, the kingdom, to my father. You know what he's telling David here? He's telling David that Mephibosheth was trying to get the throne. That's what he's telling him. You know what Ziba's doing, doing here? He's doing something that even many Christians are guilty of. He's telling a story. It's not true. It's not true. You say, wait a minute. How do you know it's not true? I'm glad you asked. 
Turn over a couple pages to 2 Samuel 19 and verse 24. You see, we know this is all a scam. We know it's all an act of deception because of what we read in verse 24 of chapter 19. And Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king. Now, David has come back at this time. And we read, uh, uh, and he, I'm sorry, had neither dressed his feet nor trimmed his beard nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he came again in peace. And it came to pass when he was come to Jerusalem to meet the king. So here's Mephibosheth. David's back in Jerusalem. We'll get there in a couple chapters. And Mephibosheth shows up there. And notice uh, what we read. And it came to pass when he was come to Jerusalem to meet the king, that the king said unto him, Wherefore wentest not thou with me, Mephibosheth? How come you didn't come with me when I left? Well, if he believed Ziba, uh, he would have been, well, because he wanted the throne. Notice Mephibosheth's answer. And he said, My lord, O king, my servant deceived me. For thy servant said, I will saddle me an ass that I may ride thereon and go to the king because thy servant is lame. And he hath slandered thy servant unto my lord the king. But my lord the king is as an angel of God. Do therefore what is good in thine eyes. He said, he lied about me. What he said to you wasn't true. I was never against you, David. He used slander to accomplish his goal of deceit. Do you recall what Ziba did in the Bible? Slander. Says it right there. Let's move on and call it also gossip. Let's call it tail-bearing. You know what gossip is? <laughs> Listen closely. Talking to others about the intimate details of people's lives for injurious purposes. Slander is this. Stating things about people that are false with the intent to harm them. Ziba slandered Mephibosheth. And you know, many of God's people are guilty of this. You know, I think the greatest enemy in any church is our tongues. Our tongues. You know, social media, well, I don't say anything. Yeah, but you type it. You've just transferred the same thing to your fingertips. It's still coming out of the same heart. We'll just group that together if you don't mind. You know, social media is a haven of gossip. It is a haven of slander. It is a haven of tail-bearing. Well, I just have social media to keep up with people that live far away. You know, in most cases, that's a lie. Some cases it's true, but that's not why. That's not why. Most people use social media as a venue to vent whatever they want to vent, to spread falsehoods, to criticize people, and to say things about people that they would never say to their face. Just say them. Right. It's the coward's way of dealing with problems. It is. God help us. Amen. God help us. It's one of the most destructive things we're seeing in our churches. Is this stuff on social media. People backbiting and slandering and gossiping. Pitting one against the other. God help us. Amen. It's terrible. Proverbs 10, 18 says, he that, hate, he that hideth hatred with lying lips and he that uttereth a slander is a fool. Proverbs 11.13, a talebearer revealeth secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. Proverbs 18.8, the words of a talebearer are as wounds. Well, they, they, they're just words. They don't hurt people. Yes, they do. Sticks and stones make my bones. No, that's not true. That's not Bible. The Bible says they hurt. Words hurt people. In fact, they hurt worse and physical wounds sometimes. 
The words of a talebearer as wounds. And they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. You know, the tongue is the most damaging thing in any marriage, church, relationship, friendship, home, school, workplace, you name it. It's one of the most damaging things. And here is this man, Zeba, with his gossip. God, I'll tell you something, David. That Mephibosheth, guess where he's at? He's in Jerusalem. Guess what he's doing? He said, the throne's coming back to Saul's house. And he knew he was the son of, grandson of Saul, so he's after the throne, David. Sad, isn't it? So we see his, his, his gossip. Uh, I'm sorry, his gifts, his gossip. Then notice his goal. What was his goal? What's he doing this for? Uh, again, we're talking about the deception of Ziba. What was his goal? His, watch this. His goal was to pit David against Mephibosheth. Why? What's it to Ziba? Why, why would he want to pit Mephibosheth against David? Here's why. Self-advancement. That's what he, he wants. David, I'm sorry, Ziba was after Mephibosheth's property. That's what he wanted. I imagine, I don't know what he was thinking. I imagine every time he goes out there thinking, I'm, I'm the guy working this land. He's not. I got my sons out here, all my sons and all my servants doing this for this guy. And he's just sitting back, reaping all the benefits. Oh, okay, well, he can't do a whole lot, but still. Who's working the land? That should be my land. I got an idea. I'm going to get this land. And he sees David at one of his lowest times in his life, walking up this hill, just crying. And he uses it as an opportunity. I'm going I'm to take care of it. I'm going to get it right now. Hey, David, guess what? You want to hear something else? Not only is your son stabbing you in the back, but Mephibosheth is too. And he did it to get the property using slander and gossip. You know, why? Why do people gossip? Why do we gossip? Why do we, why are we talebearers? Well, why? Why, why? why do people slander people? You ever wonder that? Well, there's a whole lot of motives that it could be. Sometimes people slander people because they want to be popular. They like to be the one in the know. They like to be the one that tells everybody what's happening. You know, the, 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 the town crier, if you will, you know. Oh, I got the news! Oh, what is it? What is it? What is it? And they just feed off of that. They like to be popular. Sometimes people just like to tell a juicy story. Huh, do you hear about this? Huh, huh, huh. You hear about this? Boy, this person did this. Man, we got the dirty laundry on this person. Yeah, I knew they were faking it all along. I knew they weren't really as good a Christian as they pretended to be. Sometimes we like to tell juicy stories. Uh, sometimes we, we do that to make ourselves look good. Hey, you put someone down, makes you look better. Well, see, I'm not that bad of a Christian after all. Look at, look at what they're doing. Or you're trying to make that person look bad. Perhaps you just have it out for them. Perhaps you just don't like them. Perhaps uh, you're doing it uh, to cover up one of your own wrongdoings. Sometimes people slander that as well. We see that in politics all the time. Hey, if I'm guilty, I'm going to throw the mud at somebody else and show their wrongdoing. Sometimes it's to get revenge. Just don't like somebody. So guess what? I'm going to tell this story about it. Let's see how that goes. Again, my, my, my point is this. We, have, we can, if we're not careful, have a large problem with our mouths. A, a large one. Amen. God deliver us from this deception. Amen. So we see the description of Ziba. Who he is? He was that guy with Mephibosheth. He was supposed to till and tend the property. And then we see the deception of Mephibosheth. We see the, his deception in his gifts, in his gossip, and in his goal. And then number three, notice we see the decision of David. It's kind of interesting. I think David was, again, at, at a weak point. But notice what happens in verse 4. After David hears this story, look what he does. Then said the king to Ziba, Behold, thine are all that pertained unto Mephibosheth. 
And Ziba said, I humbly beseech thee that I may find grace in thy sight, my Lord, O king. I want to say, shut up. You're making me sick. Well, my Lord, thank you so much. I think, I think that's such a wise decision to give me all of his land. You're such a wise king. David believed what Ziba said about Mephibosheth without even investigating it. Without even checking it out. Without even asking questions uh, to verify it. Without even going to Mephibosheth. He simply believed the lie of Ziba. So much so that he made this decision to say, you know what, you know what, that land is yours. Who are you on Mephibosheth? That's the way he's going to be. Yeah. Imagine if David saw Mephibosheth, whatever, in some area. But he looked down his nose. There he is, the guy who said what he said. David was deceived. He was deceived. Let me show you two things that David should have done to avoid this deception. Why did he jump to this conclusion? By the way, we do the same thing. What could he have done instead of what he did? Instead of saying, oh, he said that? Well, then, here's his property. He should have done this, number one. He should have thought the story through. Did Ziba's story even make sense? Here's what I mean by that. How could Mephibosheth become king? He had no army. He had no following. He had nothing. Right. He couldn't even fight. Right. He was a crippled man. Plus, he would, he'd have to deal with Absalom first. Right. The story doesn't even make sense. Uh, what, what he said, uh, it didn't line up uh, with Mephibosheth's character. Right. And by the way, we ought to do the same thing when we hear something. We should think the story through. Amen. I'm, I am utterly amazed at how, quickly, how quick we are to be willing to believe something bad about somebody. I mean, we just, no matter how far-fetched it may sound, and then not only believe it, but pass it on to somebody else without any evidence. And we believe, well, they said it. Oh, really? You know, uh, I don't know if I should even mention this, but maybe I will. I don't know. Maybe I'll regret it later. My wife will tell me when I get home. <laughs> you know, a while back, people were saying, the whole church has COVID. The whole church. It does. They do. <gasps> ah! <laughs> the whole church has COVID. The whole church has COVID. The whole church has COVID. Think about that. The whole church has COVID. Really? And then people were saying people had it that I know for a fact didn't have it. And it's passing along. And they pass it and pass it and pass it. And then that poor person that came to church unwittingly, and people were like, I can't believe, I can't believe they're in church. I can't believe they're in church. They got tested positive. What's the matter with us? Hey, here's a thought. Think it through. Does the whole church have COVID? How far-fetched does that sound? Amen. You know, no wonder the Bible says that the tongue is a fire, Amen. a world of iniquity. And so is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. By the way, with that Amen. went this, and I forgot to add this, and Peter's not doing anything about it. He doesn't, well, he's just dumb. He just doesn't know anything. They're, they're hiding everything. Think it through. Listen, think before you believe something someone Amen. says. Would you please think it through? Don't just receive it and pass it on, receive it and pass it on. If you don't know for sure yourself. Amen. I've heard people accuse some of our finest people in this church of something. And I, 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 the first thing I did was, that doesn't even make sense. That's so out of character for that person. Amen. You don't just say, oh, really, that happened? Oh, guess what? So-and-so did this, 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 so-and-so did this. And then what happens is you find out it's not true. Oh, it's not true. Oh, okay. And you're fine. But guess what? You just lit a fire. Right. 
Right. And the fire is raging through the church because you're passing that thing along. Think it through. David should have thought. Mephibosheth, he should have said, Mephibosheth? I mean, the way he, we talked and all that? It doesn't make sense. That's the first thing he should have done. But not the only thing. Here's the second thing he should have done. He should have searched the story out. Amen. You know, Proverbs 25 and verse 2 says this, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out the matter. Here's an, here's an idea. Here, hey, David, David, here's an idea. David was, was at a low. I, I get that. I mean, he, he's weeping up the hill. He's got all kinds of things. He's leaving his house. Uh, I mean, Absalom's moving in. He's at the top of the Now he hears this news about Mephibosheth, and he just swallows it. But what he should have done this, he should, here's an idea. Why don't you ask Mephibosheth? Just go ask him. Well, I, I don't want to do that. That's how we think of this. Listen, if you hear something that's a, ta a tail bearer, or a, 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 sounds like somebody's bearing a tail, or gossip or slander, don't just swallow it and accept the story. Don't pass it along. Go to that person and ask them. Amen. Say, hey, you know, I've been here. So is this true? Wow, there's an idea. But you know what? Oh, I, 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 I just want to. But we're so fast to pass it on. You see, that's where problems occur. That's how deception occurs. Uh, it's, it's amazing. He was so quick to give away Mephibosheth's property on one man's word. And we're so quick to throw somebody under the bus because of one man's word. Listen, when someone tells me something about somebody, first of all, if I don't need to hear it, I don't want to hear it. I really don't. I don't want to hear it. But if I have to hear it, I take it with a grain of salt, and I give that person the benefit of the doubt, and I think, you know what, I'm going to go talk to this person and see if that's true. That's the way it's supposed to be done. Now, am I perfect at everything? I am not. But that's the way it's supposed to be done. We would solve a whole lot of problems if we would simply go to the person and ask them instead of believing something that someone says. I guarantee you that there are people in this room that other people don't like simply because of the word of someone else. And they don't even know them well enough to like them or not, but they already don't like them. Because somebody told me this. and so, Stop already. Amen. Stop already. Give people the benefit of the doubt. Amen. Don't listen to the slander and the gossip and the right. tail-bearing and make a decision like David did because David was deceived. Amen. And we can be deceived as well. Oh, Zeba, what a story it is of him. But I wonder tonight, I wonder, do we have some Zebas in our midst? Story passers without verifying, trying to tell something about someone? Da -da 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 -da. We, used to, we used to talk about the phone. That was years ago. People go home and get on the phone. Now there's so many other tools people use or or instruments they use to get the information out. Now we've got to say text and Facebook and social media and all and Instagram and all that. Let me ask you something. Are you one to, to pass things along just because you hear it? Now you may be doing that because of ignorance. I don't know. But here's, here's a warning tonight. Let's stop. Amen. Let's stop. If someone says something about something we don't know, Let's just stop swallowing it and passing it, swallowing it and passing it, passing it, passing it, passing it. Right. You're only doing harm to the cause of Christ right. and the harm to God's people. Amen. So I wonder, is there a Zeb tonight? I wonder tonight also as well, maybe there's a David tonight. Somebody's telling you something. You're believing it. You're believing it. You don't know if it's true, but you're believing it. Why don't we be careful that we don't fall into this deception of gossip and tail-bearing, backbiting, slander, because that'll destroy a church. I'm not aiming at anything tonight. I'm really not. I'm not aiming at anybody. That's the story. You saw it. Zeba was a liar. He was a slanderer. Amen. He wanted something. He had an ulterior motive. He went to David with gifts. Oh, David, oh, yeah, this is for you. He told a lie, and he got what he wanted. There are people like that in this world. Be careful, be careful 
what you hear and what you believe before you act on it. Amen? Let's pray.